morning, everybody. Welcome to Takuma Island. Yes, good morning. We're glad you're back with us once again. It's hard to believe it's time for another program already. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I was wondering, Tim, what's this, this big yellow thing? It looks like a giant sun. Well, it's actually, it's a circle, but it's there to represent God. Oh, God okay, God is a represented circle. by a circle because he has no okay, beginning. Okay, no right, ending. yes, yes, I understand that. And so, and then the words around to talk about a little bit who God is and what he does, but, but this is what we're going to be talking about in the lesson. Oh, well, I'll have to stay tuned for that then. That's right, because we're going to be in the book of Judges again. And in the book of Judges, the people follow God, they turned away from God. They followed him, they turned away from God. Up and down, up and down. And so I'm going to, in our lesson, I'm going to explain kind of how that happened. And so, um, and then uh, I got a couple object lessons we're going to do today, and we got our puppets, and so I think we got a, a pretty good full, full program, program again. You know? Tom's back again with another one of his talks from Psalm 119, so okay. we got a lot to cover today. So. Okay, well let's get to it then. That's a good we'll idea. see you at the end. See you at the end. God say it's gonna rain He didn't fuss a bit and he didn't complain He filled the ark with animals to buy two And float it off in a zoo Oh yeah, you know it's true That's what believing in God can do Stand up and stomp your feet Trusting the Lord is really neat When Moses led the people from Egypt land The Pharaoh tried to catch him with a chariot band the water on a nice bright path, but God gave the soldiers a bath. Oh yeah, you know it's true, that's what believing in God can do. Stand up and stomp your feet, trusting the Lord is really neat, really neat. When David got Goliath, the Philistine, he prayed that God would help him to win. The stone he slung flew straight and steep, and he rocked that giant to sleep. That's what believing in God can do Stand up and stomp your feet Trusting the Lord is really neat Trusting the Lord is really neat sure is. Trusting the Lord is really neat That's right. Trusting the Lord is really neat Hey, good morning. Wow, you know what? I just thought of something. Maybe it's not morning when you're looking at this. So let me start over. Hi, everybody. Mr. Tom here with another look into, guess where? Psalm 119. Yep, we're still there in 119, but today we're going to look at verses 129 to 136. So here's my usual question. Got your Bible? Let's start. 129. Your statutes are wonderful. Therefore, I obey them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from human oppression, that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine on your servant and teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not always obeyed. Now, some time ago, I remember reading a story about Christians. It said that almost 95% of Americans, and Christians were involved in this study also, agreed with this following statement. Christians are allowed to practice their beliefs as long as everyone agrees with them. Then a woman added to that and claimed, we're not saying people can't be Christians, the woman said. This is a free country after all. But when Christians decide to actually have Christian beliefs about things, I'm sorry, 
That's just too far. It's almost as if they take the Bible seriously or something. <clears throat> wow. It's hard to believe Christians were involved in that study. But hey, today we saw that the psalmist says that Christians should be unwilling to sacrifice truth for the sake of unity. He displayed an absolute commitment to keeping God's truth. And his words are designed to encourage us to do the same. Being a truth keeper is the heart of what this psalm section is about. When reading this part of Psalm 119, we see three things about the psalmist. The reason he kept God's truth, the resolve or the determination to keep God's truth, and the results of him keeping God's truth. Let's look at the first reason. His deep love for God's truth. It imparts understanding to the simple. It gives light. It helps us to do good. And this is where some people get it wrong. It's not that the beliefs or it's not the benefits of truth keeping that drove the psalmist to keep God's truth. No, 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 no. Just like the same should be for us today, but simply his or our love for the truth. In other words, we should love God's truth because it's God's truth. A lot of Christians turn away from God. Why? Well, maybe it's because they only respond to God's truth that benefits them. It's like what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 13, 20, 21, in the parable about the farmer planting the seed. Remember that one? Uh, there it had fallen on rocky soil, and it couldn't take root and died. When some of the adults of Tacoma Island get together at Pastor Tim's weekly Bible studies, we have what we call a three o'clock in the morning question. Meaning around 3 o'clock in the morning, you wake up and really start to think about that question that Pastor Tim asked hours before that. Why well, have those 3 o'clock in the morning questions for you? Do you love God's word? Is God's truth wonderful to you, even if it doesn't immediately benefit you? Do you thirst to obey God's commands? Hmm. Later today or this week, I would like you to sit and talk about those questions with mom or dad. And maybe even at the dinner table, you could discuss them. Okay? The second thing we saw was the determination for the psalmist. Because the psalmist loved God's truth, he responded in a right way to the truth of God. So if you look at his expression of that love for God's truth, we see it in the form of prayers. The psalmist prayed for consistent victory, victory over sin. He says, keep steady my footsteps according to, according to your promise and let no iniquity Get dominion over me. Do you wish to gain victory over sin in your life? Do you pray for that victory? Specifically ask God to grant you victory over specific areas of weakness and temptation? Name them. If you're having a problem with something, name it. And tell God to help you with that specific thing. The psalmist also prayed to be obedient to God when in times of harassment or people were being cruel. Something is lost here that the dom yeah, that the dominus, that the psalmist is not asking for those things to stop, okay, but yet for the ability to more easily keep God's instructions. Let me say that again. I get a little twisted up in that. Something that's being lost here is that the psalmist is not asking for those things that are coming in around him to stop, 
but yet he's asking for the ability to more easily keep his eyes on God's instructions. How about us today? When times get hard or things go wrong, what is it that we are praying for? Are we driven by the desire to keep God's law, or do you simply want an easier life? Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting an easier life. Nothing wrong with it. But our quest for ease should be motive. I'm having a hard time today. Our quest for ease should be motivated by godly rather than selfish desires. Okay? If we are not motivated by a desire to keep God's teachings, then ease, making it easy, may very well lead us into sin rather than away from it. We also see a prayer for grace-filled understanding. I think it was in verse 135 where he says, Make your face shine upon and teach me your statutes. This is a very, 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 very important verse. Again, I mentioned the Bible study that some of Tacoma staff attend. We all love God's truth, but we never feel as if we do not need to know more. We always look to learn more from God's word. So no matter how long you've been a believer, you should make this your consistent prayer. You should, you see, when we're young in faith, it's easy to lap up or grab hold of the truth because we're always discovering something new in the Bible. But what happens sometimes, the more you mature in your faith, the less new insights you will find as you read the Bible. Nevertheless, we should never approach Scripture with the attitude that we have learned all there is to know. Always pray that God will open your eyes so you might behold the wonderful things from his law. And remember, the motivation for learning is obedience. Finally, the results that the psalmist finds. In the closing verse of what we read today, the psalmist is saddened over that not everyone has the same commitment to truth-keeping as he does. My eyes shed streams of tears because the people do not keep your law. The word people is supplied by translators. The verse should really say, my eyes shed streams of tears because your law is not kept. Okay? The psalmist didn't deliver, he didn't find the people, he didn't care if the people um, were Christians or non-Christians. He said, people break your law. So I, I think the psalmist deliberately left out the identity of the lawbreakers. Okay? He wept regardless. Can you generally say that you weep over those that have no regard for God's truth? Jesus grieved over Jerusalem because the people would not believe God's truth. That's found in Matthew 23. And the fault there did not lie with Jesus, but those who were unwilling to submit to the truth. Have you ever thought about why people reject God's truth? It's because they do not love him. It's that simple. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, obey my commands. Love for Christ is not something that comes naturally. Because naturally, we're born sinners, and we're enemies of God. And it takes a supernatural act of God to make us his friends. There are some who have no love for the truth, no desire to obey the truth. If so, could the problem be that they have not believed the truth? John 14, 6, Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Do you know somebody like that? Maybe God wants you to walk in his truth and let his light shine through you so you can show God's truth to a lost world. 
That's a good thought for today. Maybe God wants you to walk in his truth and let his light shine through you so that you can show God's truth to a lost world. Hey, thank you for joining me today. Mr. Tom saying bye till next time. Have a good one. girls, I'm super excited here to uh, do this object lesson today to kind of illustrate what's going to be happening through the rest of the book of Judges. Now, when we start the book of Judges, um, I kind of introduced it to you last week. Um, Joshua has died and um, there is no leader in place. God is to be the leader of the people. So up until this point, God used Moses and Joshua to guide the people. So now God is to be the leader of the people. Um, and the people, the Israelites, have to trust and have their faith in God without having someone saying, God told me this, this is what you need to do. So they have to um, trust and follow God's commandment without a specific person telling them exactly what to do. So now remember last week I told you that um, the Israelites kept taking over the land that was appointed to them after Joshua died. The, um, the tribe of Judah and the Simeonites, uh, they worked together. And remember at the end that I said they took over the land, but they didn't drive out all of the Canaanites. So God left the Canaanites there on purpose to test the Israelites. So um, they were living in the same cities, but the Israelites were still in charge, but the Canaanites were still there. And um, God left them there to test them to see if the Israelites were going to be faithful to God or if they were going to turn away and follow what the Canaanites were doing. And guess what? The Israelites failed big time. They did not do well because they saw what the Canaanites were doing and they said, hey, that's kind of cool, That even though it's not what God was doing. And then this uh, Israelite said, hey, I'm going to try this and do it like my way. This other Israelite said, hey, I'm going to try this and do it my way. So what happened was everybody did what was right in their own eyes. So now can you see how that causes some problems? Because what I think is right in this particular situation might not be exactly what you think is right in that particular situation. So it's going to cause a little bit of conflict. And if they were doing it in their own eyes, were they doing what God wanted them to do? Not always. Nope. They were not following God. They kind of forgot that God was there because they didn't have a leader that was right there saying, this is what God says to do. So now the book of Judges lasted 400 years. Yes, that's a long time. So um, I'm not going to cover the whole book of Judges right now, but in a way I am. Because in the book of Judges, there was this cycle. There was this circle that kept happening. Um, there was a pattern of behavior. So basically what happened was the Israelites started doing what they thought was right in their own eyes, which was not good. And then... They, like, the Lord actually said, God actually said, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. It wasn't good. So then they forgot about God, and things got really, really bad. But then they cried out to God and turned it around, and things got good. God made it good for them again. And then things were good, and then they fall away. They forgot that things got really bad. So there's this whole cycle. So that's what I'm going to show you today. So on here, I'm going to put people... From the book of Judges. So we're going to be talking about the Israelites. The people from the book of Judges, the Israelites. Alright. And then as I said, they started to do things that they thought were right in their own eyes. So they committed sin. They sinned. They did things that they thought were right. They didn't call out to God. They didn't listen to God. They didn't do what God was asking them to do. They fell away from God. And then, remember how God left the Canaanites in there? So he left them to test them. And the Israelites started doing things that the Canaanites were doing, which were not God's ways. So then things got bad. And then to top it all off, 
God said, hey, I'm going to test them even more. So sometimes God sent trouble. He might send another country to attack. He might send another king to take over. So he sends some kind of trouble. Maybe some drought, not enough rain, so the crops didn't grow. He allowed some kind of trouble to happen. So how do you think the people felt then? Pretty bad, I guess. Not so good, huh? But then a couple of them then said, hey, remember Grandma and Grandpa and all our ancestors were talking about how good things were when they were with God, when Joshua and Moses were leading them, and they followed God. So hey, maybe if we go back to God and we call out to God, things might get better. So the people cried out to God. And then they did something a little bit even more important than just crawling out, crying out to God. They did what we call repent. Repent means that they admitted that they had sinned. They had done something wrong and that they were sorry for it. So the people cried out to God and then they would repent. So here, you see how our cycle is going? They sinned. Things get really bad. People cry out to God and they repent. They say they did something wrong. They were sorry for it. Do you think God forgives them? Yep. God forgives them and then God sends a new leader or a new judge. God sends a judge. So this happens all the time through the book of Israel or th through the book of Judges with the Israel. The people sin. They, God lets them have some trouble. They cry out to God, say that God, this is awful. Please help us. They admit that they have sinned. God forgives them. He sends a new judge or a new leader. And then things are really good for a while. But then what do you think happens? Yep, they turn right around and they start to sin again. Now, I have some good news and some bad news for you. Our stories, our lives are very similar to the Israelites. So I'm going to take this plate and I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to put you and me in the middle. Yep, us. Okay. All right. Now, some of you are probably saying, wait, our story is like better. Um, it is better because we now have a face because God sent his son, Jesus, to be our savior. Right. So does Jesus have a face? Was he like here on uh, the earth? Yeah. So can we kind of see picture what he looked like? Sure can. Do we know that he was real? Yep. The Bible tells us about hundreds and thousands and uh, like millions of people who actually saw Jesus when he was on the earth. Okay. Do we follow the same pattern as Israelites though? Because do we see Jesus every day in our lives now? Maybe. Right. But for the most part, every day, me and you, what do we do? We sin. Do sometimes we do things that we feel are right in our own eyes, even though it might not be what God says? Yep. So we do start to follow this same pattern. We sin. And then what happens when we sin and we realize that things are not good? We cry out to God and ask for forgiveness. See anything similar? We sin, we cry out to God and ask for forgiveness. What do you think happens then? Yep. God forgives us. And he gives us grace. He says, yep, you did something wrong, but you know what? I still love you. I forgive you. So then here's how it's different. Are you ready? Here's how it's different. At this point, we can choose to stay in our sin or fall back like the Israelites did, right? You know, God's sending a judge, things got good, and then they would fall back. We can choose to do that or we can change, okay? God forgives us by giving us grace and mercy. And if we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, the Holy Spirit fills us. And then we can change our lives a little bit because we can put God first and walk with him. Right? 
He's not going to send us a new leader. He's going to fill us with the Holy Spirit if we accept Jesus as our Savior. Then we can put God first and walk with Him. However, do we always stay in that path and putting God first and walking with Him? Nope. Sometimes we do what is right in our own eyes. So then what happens again? We sin, right? Now, the only way our cycle is going to be different from the Israelites is if we put Jesus in our lives. If we accept Jesus as our Savior. If we admit that we've sinned, if we've died on uh, that he died on the cross to uh, forgive us from our, our sins, and we let the Holy Spirit fill us after we admit that uh, uh, we've sinned and admit that Jesus is our Savior, believe that he died for us, let the Holy Spirit fill us. So when we do that, we can stop seeing everything through our own eyes and start seeing life through Jesus' eyes. So now I'm going to show you what that looks like in just a second here. So, I should have started cutting this as I was talking, but um, now I'm just going to cut this plate like this. And hold on a second, I'm almost there. All right, and like I said, what we have to do is to stop doing things through our own eyes and start seeing things through Jesus' eyes. So now if I hold this up like this, though, if you look at it, all right, all those things that I had were still there. And now our goal is to be more like Jesus, to put Jesus first and to walk with him every day, right? That's like way up here on the top. You know what? We're never going to get there until we get to heaven. Okay. Every time we sin, we have to like go back and do that cycle. We, we have to ask for forgiveness. We have to repent. Jesus forgives us. And then, you know, like we try to put him first, walk in those ways. So now we're never going to be perfect like Jesus until we get to heaven. But every day we can get a little bit closer because if you see... You can't see all those words when I do this. There's a lot of white space. So um, you have to remember to go to God when you've sinned. You have to repent from your sin and ask for forgiveness. Accept that fact that Jesus died on the cross to forgive you from your sins. And then God doesn't see that whole cycle. He sees this with like the, the gaps in it. And he just sees you for who you are that you want to be with him and that you're trying to put him first and he helps you move up this spiral to be closer and closer to him all right so i really like the book of judges because it reminds me that people are human and that i'm human but it also reminds me um you know that like i'm gonna sin i'm going to fall short i'm gonna do things that i think are right in my own eyes but that's not what god wants and it also reminds me that God is always there. God doesn't change. God is the same yesterday as he was today, as he will be tomorrow. And that I can start to see things through Jesus' eyes. I can start to break that cycle and get closer to Jesus with his help. So my challenge to you is don't get stuck in the cycle. Try to break the cycle. Try to put Jesus first this week. Thank you. Have a good week. As we come to Judges chapter 2, the people have started to drive the people out. They've been having some problems. They're working together and, and things are going okay. But the book of Judges in chapter 2 kind of goes back a little bit and it talks about where Joshua uh, passes away. So it says, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each their own, their own inheritance. Now, the beginning of the next verse is a good verse. It's, it's really cool. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua 
and of the elders who outlived him, who had seen the great things the Lord had done for Israel. So as long as Joshua was alive and the elders, the people that were leading the nation of Israel, as long as they were alive, the people served the Lord. They had seen the things that God had done for Israel. You know, they were there when they crossed the Jordan River. You know, they were there at the Battle of Jericho, how God pulled the walls down and that kind of stuff. It says, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land of his inheritance. Now, verse 10, to me, is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Because verse 7 says, the people served the Lord all the days that Joshua was alive and the elders that outlived Joshua. But then, in verse 10 it says, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, so after Joshua and his generation died, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So when Joshua and his generation died, the generation that came up did not know God. They didn't even know the things that God had done for Israel. So somehow Joshua and his generation did not pass down to their children and their grandchildren who God was and what God had done. That's sad. You see, that's a big reason why we do Tacuma Island. We don't want to fall into that trap. We want to teach boys and girls the word of God so that you know God and that you can see what he has done. So on the board here, I have a circle and that circle is going to represent God. And so on this side, we have a list of some of the things that God is like. God is good. He will always do what is right. God is generous. He's a giving God. He loves to bless. God is holy. That means that he is perfect, that he cannot sin. Then it goes on and says he's righteous. That means God is good. Whatever God does is right. He will never do anything wrong. Everything he does is right, even if it doesn't seem like it to us. God is kind. Along with kind, he's merciful. We could have put that there as well. God is love. In fact, the Bible says that God loves you with an everlasting love. His love will never go away. God is all-powerful. When he makes a promise, he keeps it. He has the power to do it. He has the power to defeat any enemy, any problem that comes into our lives. So that's a little bit like what he is. What does God do? God blesses. God loves to bless his people. He blesses us every single day. In fact, James tells us every good thing that we get comes from God. It's a blessing from God. We don't deserve it, but he still blesses us. God protects. He watches over his own, protects us. He provides. God is the great provider. He's the one who will provide and meet your needs. But he's such a good God. Not only does he meet your needs, many times he even goes over and above and gives things we don't need. He will strengthen us. Some things God asks us to do are hard. He'll give us the strength to do them. When you're going through a difficult situation, he will give you the strength to go through that situation. God will equip us. If he asks you to do something, he'll give you the ability to do it. He guides us. He uses his word. He uses his spirit. He uses other people to guide us and help us to live the best possible life that we can live. And God is a God who loves to give. And so God is a great God, and he does all these great things. And he asks two things from us. He asks us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he asks us to love other people. Love God, love people. We do that, we get all of this. And God just simply says, love people and love him. That's what he wanted the people of Israel to do. But they didn't. This generation came up that did not know God. And it goes on and says, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals, served the false gods. They forsook the Lord God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. 
In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. So instead of being able to go in and conquer the people, God gave the people the ability to conquer Israel. They could no longer win the battles when they went to fight to try to drive these people out. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. So this is something God had promised them long ago. He promised them, if you will obey me and do what I ask, I will bless you. If you disobey me, then you're going to be under a curse. You're going to be under judgment. This is something they did to themselves. But look at the result. It says they were in great distress. Not because of God, but because of their poor choices, their choice to walk away from God. So you notice the way I'm standing here. This representation of God is behind me and I'm facing away from it. That's what the people did. They pretty much turned their back on God and lived their life the way they wanted to, doing what they wanted to do, what felt good, what didn't, whatever, and they kind of forgot about God. And as a result, it says they were in great distress. But then we, we see something else that's so amazing about God. Is that these people are in distress. They deserve it because of the way they've been living. But then it says, the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. God showed mercy. They were in distress. They would finally cry out to God. God saved us. Not because they wanted to serve God. Not because they wanted to love him. But because they, they wanted to get rid of the stuff that was going on in their lives. They wanted their lives better. So they called out to God. And God had mercy on them. And God would raise up a judge. And that judge would get the army together. And God would use them to drive off the people that were attacking them. And as long as that judge was alive, they would have peace. Things would go well with them. But the problem was, even while that judge was in place and things were going well, they, they kind of were like this. They didn't turn around and serve God and love God like he said. They turned kind of toward God. But they kept their eye on other stuff. And so they kind of glance at God and then they'd look at the others. They'd glance at God, then they'd go back to the way they were, living life the way they wanted to. And they kind of go back and forth and back and forth. And when the judge finally died, they turn their back on God one more time. Live life the way they want to. Forget about God. They start worshiping the false gods. Doing all that stuff. Going against what God said. God was still there. He was still good. God is still generous. He's still holy, righteous, kind, love, all powerful. All of that he had ready for them. He wanted to bless them. He wanted to protect them, to provide for them, to strengthen them, to equip them, guide them, give to them. But because they turned their back on him and wanted nothing to do with him, all this stuff that God had, he couldn't give them. He goes on and he says, whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hand of their enemies. God was doing this when the judge was alive. As long as the judge lived, for the Lord relented because of the groaning, uh, their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. God saw the hurt that they were going through. And even though they brought it on themselves, he got to the point where he said, I can't let them suffer anymore. And so he bring the judge. But when the judge died, the people returned to their ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors following the other gods serving and worshiping them. So they didn't just go back to their old ways. They went back to their old ways and got even worse. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, because this nation has violated the covenant I ordained for their ancestors and have not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel 
and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. The Lord had allowed those nations to remain. He did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. God said, Israel, you could have had me drive all those people out. You could have lived with all of this. But instead, you turned your back on it. And because of that, you're going to suffer the consequences. God had all kinds of blessings he wanted to give to them. And so here I have a container of plastic eggs. I don't know how many are in there. There's a bunch of them in there. Let's let this represent some of the blessings God wanted to give to Israel. Blessings of you know, giving them the rain that they would need so that they can grow their crops. You know, blessing of keeping their, their animals, their, you know, their herds, keeping them healthy. Uh, providing you know, uh, food for them. You know, providing the money that they need to live. Providing their clothes. You know, giving them health. Keeping them safe. All these things God wanted to give to them. They were there. They were ready. He was ready to give them to them. And yet, what did the people do? They turned their back on him. And so even if he tried to hand them out, they wouldn't even see that he was giving them. And so all these blessings that God had for them, they never received. All they had to do was just simply turn around, turn to God, and say, God, with your help, I want to love you, and I want to love people. And if they'd have done that, all these blessings could have been theirs. It's easy to talk about how foolish they were, that they had all of this stuff for them, and they gave it up. But if we're really honest, how many times do we act in a similar way? How many times do you and I, in our lives, we maybe not turn our back on God, but kind of turn to the side so we can kind of glance at him every now and then. But our focus is not so much on God, but our focus is on what's going on around us. God has two things of us. He says, I want you to love me. How can you not want to love a God who is all of this and who does all of this? How do you love God? You spend time with him. You spend time in his word. You spend time talking with him. You spend time thinking about him. As things happen, you look to him. He asks for his help, for his guidance. You spend time with other people who know him. And as you do that, as you begin to grow and love God, his blessings are there. Now, he's going to be giving out blessings anyways. But as you draw closer to him and love him, then you're going to be there to receive them. Instead of him handing out a blessing and you not being able to see it, you're going to see more and more of the blessings that God is offering. And you're going to enjoy them much more. But the second command is to love people. Don't just love God, but love people. But you see, to truly love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love people, that's something you can't do on your own. That's where God comes in. Because as you draw close to God, God promises he will draw close to you. And as he draws close to you, he will not only bless you, he'll watch over and protect you, he will provide what you need, but he will strengthen you. He will give you the ability to love others. He will equip you, he'll help you to be able to love people that are hard to love, that are difficult to love. He will guide you step by step. He's a generous God. He'll be given to you. So the question is, what are you going to do about it? As you go through this coming week, are you going to take time to focus on God, to think about who he is and what he does? Or are you going to just live your, the week yourself, doing what you want, and not really think about God. The choice is yours.
the lesson, we saw that the people of Israel had a God who loved them, a God who wanted to take care of them, who wanted to bless them. All he asked them to do was to love him and to love others. And yet what they did was they turned their back on God and followed false gods and went their way instead of God's way. And as a result, they made life harder and more difficult for themselves. You see, I have a circle back here, and that circle represents God. The people were looking away from God rather than to God, and as a result, they did not have the joy, the peace, the excitement in their lives that they, they really wanted. But we kind of do the same thing. So here I've got a couple of dice, but these are not normal dice. These dice have words on them. And the words on them are, uh, let's see, we have uh, angry, content, worried, happy, excited, different things that happen to us throughout the day. And so as we look at this, the day goes along and all of a sudden something happens and we get excited. Something good happens. Then something else comes along and it's another good thing, we're content. Things seem to be going our way. And so we're good about that. But then, uh-oh, now we get tired. When you get tired, then other things begin to come along. Like, let's see, you get worried. Sometimes you wind up, you're getting afraid or you get sad. And so these things are coming at us all the time. But the problem is we have a tendency of just focusing on these things. Sometimes we're hurt. Sometimes we're afraid. Uh, sometimes we're excited or content. But if all we do is just focus on the stuff that's happening to us, then we're going to be up, we're going to be down. We're going to be up, we're going to be down. Kind of like the Israelites. But do you see something missing in this? God. And so I've got another die back here, down here. This one's a little bigger. This is going to represent God. Okay, this one has numbers on it. And I have a paper or tablet here that has some words on it. So let's roll this one. Okay, that's a two. So let's say you're hurt and sad. Instead of focusing on being hurt and sad, number two, you look at God and say, God, you are good. God, if you're a good God, then whatever you've allowed to happen to me that's caused me to be sad or has caused me to be hurt is because you know it will work out for my good at some point. I can trust you for that. Or let's say uh, five, faithful. God, you're faithful. You've promised in your word that you're going to work things out for my good. You've promised that you're going to bless me. You promise that you love me. I'm going, to hold, I'm, I'm going to trust those promises because you are faithful. And so then what happens as these different things happen to us, if you get worried, you can look at God and say, well, God, you're holy. That means you're perfect. You know exactly what's going on. You're going to watch over. You're going to protect me. Uh, number one, God, you love me. You love me with an everlasting love. You're going to watch over me. You're going to protect me. And so instead of just focusing on the stuff that happens, take a moment, turn your thoughts to God, and say, God, you love me with an everlasting love. I don't deserve it, but you love me. God, you're good. You're always good. Everything you do is good and right. If you've allowed this to happen, it's going to work out for good. God, you're kind. God, even though this is happening to me, you've got a reason you've allowed it to happen. You're holy. You're faithful. God, you're generous. And start thinking about who God is and what God does, and that'll help get your focus off of this stuff that's going on. Put your focus on God. Then he will become the foundation. And whatever you're going through, Instead of just trying to handle it on your own, you'll have God's help as you do it. 
Now, the times in my life where I've just focused on what's going on around me, I've really not been that happy. I've kind of regretted it, but I've never regretted a time where no matter what was going on, I look at God first and let him take care of it. So this week, you've got a choice. As you go throughout your day this week, these things are going to happen. Are you going to focus on those things or are you going to focus on the God who is bigger than those things and has promised that he's going to help walk you through anything that comes into your life? Well, here we are at the end of another Tacoma Island Online. Yes, we're by quick again. And we were able to find out what this big yellow sign oh, yeah, because was. this side here, it tells us who God is. He's good, generous, holy, righteous, kind, love, and all-powerful. And then this side tells us what the things that he does. He blesses, he protects, he provides, strengthens, he equips, guides, gives. This God is an amazing God. He does all of this for us. And yet so often we're tempted to turn away from him mm -hmm. or go our own and way. And complain. And complain, yeah. Yeah, because we don't get our way, even though his way is better than our way. That's right, but sometimes we think our way is mm -hmm. better. But right. we wouldn't actually say that to God, but we no, kind of no. think that. But anyways, um, I guess that wraps up for today. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're, once again, we're glad you joined us. We hope yes. we'll see you soon. And you take care this week and stay safe and stay well. Bye-bye. Yes.